I'm not going to give her a long introduction. Suffice it to say, um, meeting this Holocaust survivor, Magda Brown, who flew in from Chicago last night, was one of the highest privileges I have ever had. Please give her a nice welcome, Magda Brown. Thank you very much, Mr. Pratt. Good morning, everyone. And it is great to have such a lovely audience to talk to. Well, my name is Magda Brown. I was born and raised in Hungary under absolutely normal circumstances, just like any of you. Matter of fact, just for one show and tell I have, and that is my eighth grade graduation photo, which proves that I wasn't any different than any of you children. I had my religious upbringing, I had my loving parents, etc., and I had a lot of stuff, just like any of you. So what happens when the pendulum swings and from a happy-go-lucky teenager comes a suddenly grown-up adult? Well, this goes back to the onset of the Nazi era and its reflections. But before I go into my testimony, many times I address an audience and the youngsters have never met a Holocaust survivor. So one time I spoke to a group of all oh, sixth graders and out of curiosity I asked them, how did you imagine a Holocaust survivor looks like? Well, there were a variety of comments and one would say old and gray-haired and bent over and skinny. And then one little boy in the front row whispered, I think she, looks like a, she look, would look like an amputee. And that really caught my interest because basically, even though us survivors have our limbs, but we are amputees as a result of all the tragedies we encountered. So that was a very powerful statement from a little boy. So nevertheless, we are here to tell our testimonies for a major reason. As all of you know, the Holocaust era was close to 70 years ago. Life goes on, times have changed, both politically and, and in our private lives. And why are we here to address this major subject? Well, there are a number of reasons. First of all, the Holocaust, as with the uh, conjunction with the Second World War, belongs to history. But we are here to, to make you understand the importance of what we went through so you do not repeat that tra those tragedies so you know how to stand up to the bullies and to the bad people. Anyhow, in order to give a, just a little bit of history lesson, because I was born in Hungary, because I went through the Holocaust through the Hungarian aspect of it. It's the same tragedy, but in a different fashion. So, as you have studied already in the history books, the Nazi era begins in 1933 with the rise of Hitler, and the Germany erects many anti-Jewish laws called the Nuremberg Laws, etc. And the Second World War begins in uh, 1939, where the Nazi army enters many of the European countries, except for Hungary. Hungary is an ally of Germany, and as such, they stay away from us. So when the Nazi army enters a country, for instance, like Poland, the first thing is they incarcerate the Jewish people into a ghetto, from there into a concentration camp, and then the killing machine begins. We in Hungary are still in our homes. We are still going to school. We are having still our, our work uh, places, etc. But don't entertain the idea that our life is hunky-dory, as they say here. No, it was not. What happened from 1939 on, 
First of all, the Hungarian government becomes extremely anti-Semitic, very, very, very much to the right. And Hungary starts enacting the anti-Jewish laws fashioned after the Nuremberg laws. So I'm going to just cite a very few to make you understand what we were hit with on almost like on a daily basis. For instance, intermarriage was a no, no. Well, you know, you feel sorry for the young couples. They are in love and so forth. But you certainly can live with that. But then came more serious laws where they would, co they would confiscate your valuable properties. Like, let's say you own a big manufacturing place or a farm or something of, of, of substance. Now, not like in America. We are used to transactions with, uh, with uh, lawyers and, and uh papers and documents, etc. zero. You are a Jew, you can no longer own this property, goodbye. That's it, not, not, not no repayment or none of those normalcies that we are accustomed to. Then came another law, and that was dealing with the military. Until about 1940, all young men of military age would be inducted into the service, just like no distinction between religions, and they would serve the country. Matter of fact, my father was a dedicated World War I veteran, very proud of his medals. We were very patriotic Hungarians, and country came first, etc. And now in 1940, 41, thereabouts, the government comes up with a new law, which deals with that the, the Jewish young man who is of military age cannot wear the country's uniform nor bear arms. However, he still has to enter the military. So how does it play out? Very simply, my, par my brother was to be about 1942 military age. So my parents had to outfit him with civilian clothing, just like when your kids go to overnight camp. And he leaves home, enters the Hungarian military compound, where they have a designated section for the Jewish work commando. From this moment on, they are under military supervision. And in addition to their civilian clothing, they have to wear a yellow armband on their left arm further indicating that they are Jewish. Then there is another restriction among many, and that is that they no longer have freedom of movement, whereas the regular soldier will have passes, go visit family or movies or what have you. The Jewish boy is already imprisoned in this military compound. They are treated very badly, both physically and emotionally. They are given the most menial jobs you could possibly imagine. And so it's, it's a lot of suffering taking place. Also, there is one important military aspect here. And that was, I mentioned earlier that Hungary was an ally of Germany. And now we are talking history of 1942 or thereabouts, where Germany is fighting the Russians. And Hungarian military is joining the, the German troops on the Russian front. So the Hungarian military now pulls in all the Jewish men, not necessarily young men who are to be inducted into the service, but any Jewish men uh, between 20 and 45, and take them with to the Russian front and the Jewish men are really the guinea pigs. They are put in the front line. They are walking through the minefields, blown up, uh, frozen to death, abused, anything you could imagine. So a lot of our Jewish men, are, we are losing them through these sources. But on the other hand, we are still at home in our own uh, living quarters, etc., cetera, and uh, making the best of life. There was one more anti-Jewish law that I would call your attention to, and that dealt with the educators, researchers, scientists, 
journalists, uh, physicians, uh, uh, pharmacists, and so on. From one day to the next, they got the pink slip. You're out of a job. No reason except that God gave them the right to be born Jewish. That was it. So can you imagine all the educators who were at different universities and so on were without them now? I mean, you know, these men were left. Go the government didn't care that they will lose that many good potential teachers and so on. Now they were Jewish, they could no longer function in these capacities. Now here is an important point that I want to call your attention to. It is not only that professor or that uh, per journalist who lost the job, but he had families. And there was no such a thing as welfare system. There was no government help whatsoever so the Jewish communities had to pool their resources in order to support these many thousands of families. So I think that I gave you an overview on, on the anti-Jewish laws, which were, by the way, enacted as legally as we go to the Capitol and present a law to be passed, and it was, and it was enacted. During the time between 1939 and 1944 in Hungary, there are a lot of quiet anti-Semitism is erupting, which means that there's immense graffiti all over on the streets, on, on, in the papers, and media. Not only that, even films are created anti-Semitic, hating the Jew for millions of reasons that they invented. So the people are brainwashed quietly, even the ones who were normal, peace-loving individuals, no hatred, but they were brainwashed with all this material over and over again. There are a lot of abuses. Uh, older Jewish men would be attacked by uh, the Hungarian Nazi party, that which was comprised of a bunch of young, uneducated hoodlums. So these were some of the tragedies that were taking place from 39 to 44, but I have to emphasize we are still in our own home, which is much better than our fellow Jews in the other parts of the world. Uh, in, in about a couple of months before March of 1944, Hitler decides that Hungary has not done enough with the final solution. The final solution was the key word to Hitler for eradicating the Jewish and the undesirable race. You see, Hitler wanted three things. He wanted the absolutely perfect race, not only physically but mentally. He wanted space and he wanted slaves, and he pretty nearly accomplished his goals. March 19, 1944, the Nazi army literally walked into Hungary. No resistance, no gunshed, no fighting, nothing. They walked in, and what they say, hell broke loose, I think it's an understatement. In no time at all, I say about in a week's time, we were ordered to wear a Jewish star, and that had to be sewn on our clothing very, very tightly, and without that, we were not permitted to go anywhere out of our homes. And ironically, even tiny children had to wear this star on their clothing, otherwise they could not be sent outdoors. But this is nothing. In about another 10 days, we got an order that the Jewish people will be concentrated into a ghetto. Now here I'm gonna give you a little English lesson. In America, we understand that a ghetto is where an ethnic group resides, but they certainly have total freedom to come and go wherever they want. Now, well, that's here, thank God, but in Europe, it was something totally different. So we got the order that a section of, I lived in a big city, so a section of the city was allocated to become the ghetto. And 
an order comes for the people who were living in, in the outside areas that in an hour's time, they have to pack about a two-day provision and meet on the street. Now try to visualize, put yourself in this condition. You are maybe a four or five year old child. The mother is home alone. Remember I told you the father was already on the Russian front. L alive or not, it's unknown. So the mother is all alone. She could have four or five children. And, and in those days, the, the grandparents lived with the, the younger people. So who knows what, how many people she had in that house. She had the one hour to make decision to, pick, to pack that one bag full of stuff for everybody. Put yourself in the position of your mother tells you, go to your room, pack your bag. Now remember, you're not a 17-year-old, but you're maybe a four or five-year-old. What do you put in there? Well, a child will probably put a toy in there or, or a book or candy or whatever. Nevertheless, it's a very stressful situation. And now the hundreds of people are lined up on the street. And here comes the tragedy of tragedies. The Hungarian police had an umbrella group called the gendarmes. These were the most inhuman beings on earth. And I don't even give them a courtesy of people. Because I recognize the fact that a soldier has to obey his orders. I mean, that's a universal situation. I respect that. But they were given orders which they obeyed 200% more than what they were expected to do. They were brutal, they were mean. It, it, is, it would take hours to describe their brutality. So now this herd of people are lined up and they have to march to the designated area that was to be allocated to become the ghetto. By the way, there's no such a luxury as a carpool or a bus ride or train ride or any of the things that, thank God, we are accustomed to. On foot, pushed, shoved with bayonets and whatever. The people arrive to the designated area which is to become the ghetto. Well, here is a situation. I lived in the ghetto. I was born there. My grandfather built that house like 40 years before that. I, w I was raised there and I had all my stuff there. So here comes this herd of people. And by the way, we were six people in that house. My parents, my brother and I, and an aunt and an uncle. Very comfortable home, everything fine, Every room for everyone. So now this gendarme comes looks at my house, just in his mind's eye, he figures, well, this many people can live here. Ladies and gentlemen, my home became the residency for 40 people. You cannot fathom what it is having that many people in one enclosure. A, think psychologically. There are every human behavior present in that among those 40 people, from old one to young one to sick one to, to nasty one to quiet one, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, here we are. You have to learn to share. Now remember, I lived there all the time. I had all my stuff. All of a sudden, they're walking all over my stuff. But you see, you, you, you can't be selfish here. You give, you share. I had a closet full of clothing, so the people who came with a little bag full, they could have all, all my things. So this was the first time that I learned how to share. Life, once all the people were moved into this locale, the place was fenced off, and now we were imprisoned in this area. No more out. You could not go to school, to a doctor, by the way, the jobs were already taken away from us weeks before that. So there was no money earned, nothing. Back in, the, in my particular house, the people were a little bit luckier than in other homes because my father was in the meat market business. And in those days, 
They used to smoke meat to preserve it for the winter because it did not re require any refrigeration. So our attic was packed with smoked meat, and thus we were able to feed these people as well as we could. We could not go to markets anymore. Food was scarce. So things were very, very tight. It, again, it would take hours of description to, to explain more how sad and tragic these situations were. I will give you two of my personal observations. One I call the illegal robbery, and one I call the legal robbery. I mentioned to you about the Nazi hoodlums. They would walk into the ghetto. Now remember, I told you they were all beautifully furnished homes. They would pick up a painting, they would pick up a carpet, a silverware, whatever. I mean, it's a house that has things in it. And walk out with it. I have a point to make here to make you understand not so much of what they stole, but my family goes back to that exact location for at least five generations that I know of. Until this time, the police protected me as well as anybody else. No more. These hoodlums could come, they could rob, they could take, walk away with, and we were too scared to resist. So this is my illegal robbery. And the legal robbery came in a different fashion. We got an order from the government that all our cash, jewelry, and other valuables, including radios, have to be turned in. Now, you, I told you that we were not earning any salaries anymore. But you see, in those days, these are heavy, difficult war times. People try to save every penny in order to have some cash for tomorrow because God knows what will be. So everybody had, like in America, they say hidden in the mattress. Everybody had a little bit of money put aside. Again, we were too scared not to turn it in because if they found that the punishment would be very bad. Here I have a reason to tell you that too because the money they confiscated from us paid the Hungarian railroad worker to ship us to our death. Simple as that. We were in the ghetto for just a couple of weeks. You see, the Nazis sent in Eichmann. That's a terribly bad man who was the expert on Jewish concentration, of Jewish killing. And uh, actually, he came into Hungary with a very small group of his henchmen. But they have become so proficient in killing in the five years from 39 to 44 that by the time they are in Hungary, they are able to accomplish the impossible. In 51 days, they manage to relocate 440,000 people from their home into the concentration camps. Now this, forget for a split second the emotional aspect of this. Just the, the, the movement of getting the people out of their homes at, and ghettos and so on and so on. But they're able to accomplish it because of their expertise in organizing. And the major thing, the utmost cooperation of the Hungarian police and military. They did all the dirty work. The Nazis were just directing. So now we are getting the order that the uh, ghetto will be evacuated. And we are told that we are going to be relocated to another country because they need laborers. Well, okay, but here comes the lie of the lies. The families will stay together. Now, what does it translate to you? It means that people will remain calm. After all, you will be together, you don't lose one another, and you have to think historically at this point. We are getting close to the Allies landing at Normandy. We already know that the 
end of the war is coming pretty soon. So we figure, all right, will they take us, we'll do our labor, we'll come back home, and life will continue. Unfortunately, that doesn't play out that way. Now we are <coughs> evacuating the uh, ghetto. You walk out of your home with that little bag full of stuff, and you never, ever again see anything out from that home. It is confiscated, and you can never get it back. So if you were lucky enough to return, that's another issue here. We are gathered together. We have to march through town. And this was a very sad moment, I think, in my father's life. My father was a very philanthropic individual. Not only did he help Jewish causes, but he helped the whole community. He was a close friend of the mayor and he would participate in many local philanthropic activities. Now we are marching through the middle of the main street where his business was, that he worked six days a week very hard to make us a living. And he walks, and some people are standing on the curbside, snickering at you, slurring all kinds of bad remarks at you. There were some decent people, I have to admit, who stayed behind the curtains and would not do anything. But there were many who, who were not too nice. We walk through this main street and we end up at the other side of town in a brickyard. So you wonder why in heaven's name did they, did they bring us to a brickyard? The brickyard has absolutely nothing there except bricks. There is no bathroom facilities, there is no furniture, there is no roof over your head. It's an empty field with bricks. But you see, even that was very cleverly arranged because the brickyard is adjacent to the railroad tracks and that will become the, the transportation point to our death. On my 17th birthday, on June 11th, we were crowded into a cattle car. 80 of us, were, approximately 80 of us were shoved in here. And the capacity of a cattle car is maybe for 25 people. All these many people were so crowded in that you really were squashed together inch, uh, inch by inch you could move one way or another. In order to allow my parents to sit on the wooden floor, I stood for three solid days, shifting one inch this way, one inch that way. Once they slammed the door on us, it was dark, except the little sunshine would creak through the, 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 the crevices of the, the paneling. It had a tiny window, not bigger than maybe 14 by 17, and even that had a barbed wire uh, across it. Now we are talking about June, we are going about heat, we are talking about the extreme heat within this enclosure. Uh, the odor is unbelievable because who knows when we had a bath before that. There are no bathroom facilities, there is a bucket put in the corner. And again, like I described to you earlier of the different human behaviors, the same thing is happening here. I will cite you one very impressionable moment in my life at this stage. In the corner sat a young woman with a baby on her bosom, but that baby was already dead. But she held on to that baby. Uh, the, the journey was as treacherous as one can't even describe it. Uh, we had very little food but nobody was really hungry. And we would be traveling on a very slow pace because you have to recognize this is wartime. So the military trains would be ha handling the main thoroughfare. And when they had space, we, they would move us. Otherwise, they would sit us in the a, in a back of the uh, railroad tr tracks or something. But we had no exit. We didn't know where we were. It may be somebody who stood by the window and happened to spot the name of a town or something like that. So everything was bad, but there was one thing that's above 
beyond everything else. Thirst. You cannot fathom, and I don't wish you ever in your life to encounter what it is to be for three days without water. You can't imagine the torture that is. You see what happens, your mouth becomes full of sores, your lips are parched, and furthermore, your mind is totally focusing on a drop of water. You forget about your current situation, you forget about the pain, any, all those other issues are put to the wayside. The only thing you concentrate on, if I could only have a drop of water. So everything goes in these conditions. And one, and I think about the second day or thereabouts, somehow or another, I got shifted to the little window. And I look out, and we were just about crossing the Carpathian Mountains, which is a beautiful mountain range between Hungary and Czechoslovakia. And I look out, and in the distance, I see a shepherd mining his, his flocks. So I look, and I think to myself, how come he's there and I am here? At that point, I thought that the entire world was incarcerated in cattle cars. I couldn't visualize any other existence in the whole world. So anyhow, these were some of the major impressions in the boxcar. Now we arrive on the third day, the train stops, doors open, and some very, very strange looking men in striped uniform enter the boxcar, and they speak a different language, but by this time, you understand sign language, you understand whatever they tell you, do this, push this way, you just move like a robot. Anyhow, what they were trying to do is uh, encourage us to get out as fast as we can, but leave the little bit of belongings that we had from home in the boxcar so we can retrieve it later. Well, later never comes because all that, ma all that material that is left in the boxcars, I found out later by a different uh, prison cr crew gets recycled. They go through every piece of stuff, and the valuables, what they might find, that is confiscated and goes to the fatherland. Anyhow, now we have exited the boxcar, and the men are separated. And unfortunately, that's the last time I see my father, my uncles, any male member who was with us on the train. And now there are a sea of people. Now here I'm gonna throw at you another statistics. I told you the 51 days, I told you the almost close to half a million people. But you see, it would have not been feasible to send one train on a journey, which they call the transport. So they would couple together as many as 50, 55 of these cattle cars, do your math. That's several thousand people arriving per transport. I found out in later statistics that Hungary exited 147 transports in the 51 day span. And that's how this half a million number adds up. So now we are at least 3,000 people or so lined up of women. And then uh, unique things happen here. My auntie cautions me to hold on to my mother so we don't lose one another. Uh, excellent suggestion, except it backfired. As we march forward, a group of Nazi officers are facing us, and their hands go up like this. Now, by now, we understand that means stop. Fine. A Nazi officer steps forward, and with his index finger points at you, so you understand, you were told, move like this, so you, I move like that. To my mother, move that way. Now, my mother was holding on to me. Could that have been the logic behind that? I don't know, because my mother was an exceptionally young-looking 42-year-old, so easily could, she could have gone with the living. But unfortunately, she went that away, and I will touch upon that away in a moment. 
So now we are like a machinery. You can't imagine how, what speed this whole procession goes. From here, we have to go into a room, disrobe completely. The last stitch of clothing we had from home, put it on the floor, you'll get it later. Forget it, never comes. We are stark naked and we are escorted to another room. And there a unique thing happens. From the empty room, some women are coming out, young women, and they are screaming. I mean, you haven't heard crying and screaming in your life like that is. And they look so funny. They, we couldn't recognize them. Well, what has happened, they shaved your hair bald, all your body hair, and they sprayed disinfectant on you. See, at the moment when we saw those girls, in the shock, or I don't know how to describe it, we ended up giggling because they looked so funny. Little did we realize that five minutes from now, we will be in the identical situation. So this was the procedure. And I always mention this to the young girls in the audience because I was your age. And I know how much time you spend with your hair. And I wasn't any different. At 17, that's your major focus on life, to have a pretty hairdo. And to lose that, it's a terrible emotional shock. So now from here, they are escorting us to a shower. By the way, don't think of the shower that you took this morning. It's nothing more than an empty room with shower heads screwed into the ceiling. And a trickle of water reaches your body. If I were to measure that in my kitchen measuring cup, I swear to you it wasn't more than maybe three cupful in total. No soap, no water, no, no towel, no clean underwear. In a wet body, we are pushed into another room which has a mountain of clothing, I mean to the ceiling. Some person behind it throws a garment at you. They don't look at you, are you fat, are you skinny, are you tall, whatever. Whatever she decides throws at you and that's it. I ended up with a long slip. No underwear, no stockings, no shoes. For shoes we got flip-flops with wooden soles. You know those Dutch clogs that they use. And this was our new appearance. We actually could not recognize one another. We literally had to look into the eyes or start listening to the voices until we actually recognize our friends or, or uh, if there were any relatives. From here, we were escorted into a room, a totally, totally empty room, only wooden floor, nothing more in it. And this was our sleeping quarters. The room would hold perhaps 200, but scientifically, they managed to put 500 into the room. In order for us to sleep, we were laid down like sardines in a can, our flip-flop shoes were our pillows, and the body heat next to you was your heat. There was no such a thing as going out to the bathroom. They gave a bucket in the corner of the room, and that was it. Now, I have to emphasize for the young people, it wasn't a bathroom, it was a latrine. And a latrine is nothing more than a giant hole dug in the ground that is... Um, covered with a wooden plank, and it holds around, am I running out of five minutes? Okay, I can do five minutes. Anyhow, I mean, there's another half hour to go, but what the heck. Uh, so all in all, we weren't able to So life in Auschwitz, we are in Auschwitz now. We Auschwitz, Birkenau, we are in Birkenau. Let me tell you why. Birkenau was a, a, an area that was created maybe a year or two before 1944, where they leveled off about seven uh, Polish villages surrounding Auschwitz and created a new camp, which was to be the transitory camp to the crematorium, because the crematorium was in that area. They built additional railroad tracks to get the people closer to the crematorium. So therefore, when you see any Holocaust-related photos of prisoners in cots laying down. We had none of that because we were already destined to be killed. The important message here is, because I have to 
bind that up. Very important stuff. Uh, the crematorium. I make it a point to explain the, the studies about the crematorium to make you understand that it was real, it existed, and unfortunately there are many deniers to this day who claim that the crematorium was a farce. Therefore, I'll tell you what they did. They had the people who were destined to be killed, they put them into a shower, to the uh, undressing room, and they would hang up their clothes on a clothes rack rather than just dumping it all over. And the clothes hooks had numbers on them, which would, they would tell them that you will remember the number your clothes is hanging on so you can retrieve your clothing. And from here they were escorted into an, a room which was to be the shower in their minds. They overcrowded the people in here way beyond capacity, slammed the door on them. On the outside, they had some Nazi soldiers with gas masks on, and they had Cyclone B gas pellets in their hands. The roof of the, this, this uh, shower room had two hermetically sealed windows that could be opened by these soldiers, and they would dump the pellets into the room, slam the windows so it was hermetically sealed, and from the heat, and the, uh, the lack of oxygen, all this, the, the gas pellet would explode, thus suffocating the poor people. And this is how the, they died. From here, there was a special commando that had to remove the gold teeth and gold bridges from the mouth of the deceased people. The, from here, they threw them into the ovens of the crematoriums, burned them, and their ashes are strewn all over. This is a very sacred ground in Auschwitz that has to be remembered for their memories. As far as the, uh, the denial goes, when our General Eisenhower liberated Orndorf, a very important concentration camp, he was appalled what he saw. There were hundreds and hundreds of dead bodies all over the grounds, and the ones who were still living were walking around like zombies. He summoned his soldiers and said, you have to take as many photographs as you can because the world will not believe this. So for the student's benefit, I'm gonna read his remarks so you fully understand what our President of the United States General at that time has said. I have never felt able to describe my emotional reaction when I first came face to face with indisputable evidence of Nazi brutality and ruthless disregard of every shred of decency. I visited every nook and cranny of the camp because I felt it my duty to be in a position from then on to testify at first hand about these things in case there ever grew up at home the belief or assumption that the stories of Nazi brutality were just propaganda. So, very briefly, I finished a two-month stint in Auschwitz. I was relocated to an ammunition factory in Germany, which manufactured rockets and bombs. And there we worked with highly poisonous material, which affected our body. After a couple of months, when our hair started growing out, we were looking at each other, and our black or blonde hair was no longer that color. It was orange, our face was lemon yellow, and our lips deep purple. The poison started affecting our body, and if the war would have not come to an end soon, I wouldn't have the pleasure of talking to you. But God bless the 6th Armored Division of the United States government. And I hope that in all my talks, sometimes I meet someone from that division, but they were wonderful in liberating us so I can be here and talk to you. Thank you very much.